go ahead. My name is Eric Newman, and I'm the founder and head of product design at Seneca Boards, a Bozeman-based custom ski and snowboard manufacturer. I love skiing, but what got me interested in ski design was, ironically, an accident I had skiing. In 2007, I broke my back in three places, and my neck, and my sternum. I didn't know whether I would ever ski again, and while I recovered, I thought about what skiing meant to me. And I realized that what I loved most about skiing was sharing it with other people, and sharing my passion with other people. So I started a company called Seneca Boards to do just that. The goal of Seneca was to give people the ability to be better skiers and to encourage them to have more fun skiing by designing custom skis for individuals rather than the masses. Since it started, I've built over 500 pairs of skis, many of which have been custom, and I want to share with you tonight what I've learned about ski design. So let's start with length. Length is the most obvious aspect of choosing a ski, but often the most overlooked. There's two lengths that are important in ski design. The overall length, which is what's written on the ski, and the running length, which is what you actually feel. Uh, the overall length varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. The running length is the length that you feel on the ski. It's the length between the camber. And you can have two skis of the same overall length with totally different running lengths and totally different feels because the tip and tail length are different. A good example of this is twin tips. So twin tips were introduced in about 1998 and you can have a ski that has a upturned tail that's never going to actually touch the snow and it's going to shorten the effective edge. Another good example of this is early rise and that's something that we see a lot today. So let's talk a little bit about early rise and camber. Camber is added to a ski to add stiffness to it without adding weight. It also distributes the weight of the skier to the tip and the tail of the ski. Uh, Shane McConkey noticed that camber causes skis to die when powder. He also noticed that powder is more like water than it is like hard snow. So he took a pair of water skis and he mounted ski bindings on them. He skied a peak in Alaska and the result was the invention of the rockered ski. Unfortunately, rockered skis are very difficult to ski on hard pack. So the solution was early rise, which is a reverse camber in the tip of the ski, a traditional camber under foot. Side cut is what's created when you have a narrower waist in the ski than the tip and tail. And it's often reported on a ski as the turning radius. This is the radius of a circle whose arc connects the tip, waist, and tail of the ski. And it's a good indication of the size of the turn that ski wants to carve. Now, actually what happens with side cut, it doesn't actually cause the ski to carve. What it does is when you roll the ski on edge, it creates a void underfoot. And the ski wants to contact the snow equally along its whole length, so it bends. So what side cut actually does is gives the ski a propensity to bend. So because of that, when we design skis, we design skis based on flex and bend, first and foremost. Now, you can have a ski that's a softer flex that will bend farther under the same weight as a stiffer ski. And this isn't necessarily an indication of its strength. From an engineering perspective, what happens when we bend or flex a pair of skis is that the bottom of the ski stretches and the top of the ski compresses. The middle of the ski actually stays the same. And to take advantage of that, we use really high strength to weight ratio composites on top of and below the core of the ski. These are composites like fiberglass, carbon fiber, and titanium aluminum alloy. What else is used in skis? Well, the bases are made out of UHMW plastic. This stands for ultra high molecular weight. Really all that means is that it's a really low friction plastic that allows the ski to glide. It's also a sintered plastic that allows the base to absorb wax, which is very important. The core of the ski is either a foam core or a wood core. Wood is preferable because of its natural flexural properties, but it's also more expensive. Because stiffer woods are always heavier, we often use a blend of stiff woods and soft woods to give you a good balance of stiffness to weight. Finally, all these components are combined together, the base, edge, core, and structural materials. They're put in a press and pressure is applied to force them into a mold, and that mold forms the ski to the tip, early rise, camber, and tail shape. 
It applies heat and cures that ski into the solid. The last thing that we do when we make skis is that we tune them. And the first part of that is that we run the ski through what's called a stone grinder. This flattens the base of the ski, and it also engraves a pattern in it that allows the ski to remove water from the base, similar to the way the tread in a tire works. The next thing that we do is we bevel the base edge. We bevel the base at an exact degree so that the skis can slide side to side without feeling grabby. After that, we need to bevel the side of the edge to bring the edge back to a 90 degree angle or more so that it will feel sharp. After that, we add wax to the ski. When skis slide over snow, they create friction, and that friction melts a small layer of snow into water. The water is repelled by the wax in the ski, and that's what propels the ski forward. If you have too soft of a wax, the snow crystals dig into it and the ski feels sticky. So it's important to match your wax to the hardness and temperature of your snow. For me, as a ski designer, what makes me happiest is pairing people with the right equipment. And the first step in doing that is educating people. So that's what I wanted to do tonight, is to educate you a little bit about the importance of ski design and ski fit. The future of skiing is incredibly exciting. There's lots of new technologies such as carbon fiber and automated equipment that can do amazing things for the design of skis. And a lot of small manufacturers that are really pushing the limits of the sport. So I hope that tonight's talk will encourage you to look into small manufacturers like myself and consider us in choosing your skis.